Right, good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with a very short reading, and so will Mala, and then we will try and bring in the conversation to the subject decided. I moved to Delhi from Bombay in the 1950s and was immediately struck by the broad avenues and wide open spaces of Delhi, punctuated with weathered monuments, the aging patina reflecting the dancing rays of early morning and evening light. It was all larger than life, powerful and fragile at the same moment. I'm going to read the counter to what I've written. <laughs> Uday Kumar's office was situated in a part of Delhi where the frenzy of the new city had yet to invade. The area was protected by a large green buffer, the ridge, and the aged buildings of the university slowed the onslaught of development, their oldness shaming even the most heartless bulldozer. Until recently, the chief minister's offices were situated here, and the area remained close to the corridors of power, but it moved at a pace that suggested skepticism towards the world-class city baying at its borders. Thanks, Wala. So good afternoon. Uh, what we just did was I read from Mala's book, Perpetual City, a short biography of Delhi, and I think is also her memoir. And she read from my book, which is called The Price You Pay, The Price You Pay for Living in That Perpetual City, uh, which is a fiction, a uh, work of fiction. Mm. And throughout the talk, we will go back to our, each other's readings and read from that. But to keep close to the conversation we are supposed to have today, which is about power, which is about Delhi and what it signifies to its citizens. I will start by asking Mala, before we get on to it, you know, Mala and I come from uh, different perspectives. Of course we do. Uh, I mean, you know, she's of a generation which is earlier. She has seen the Nehruvian era. I saw it at its end. But Mala is an insider to Delhi in a way which I am not. I come to Delhi in my... He's the voyeur. <laughs> I'm the voyeur, yes. You know, Mala lives in the uh, most affluent parts of Delhi. Uh, I better not speak about my living conditions anyway. Uh, but <laughs> when, when I, I, I read Mala, when I read the book, and we were supposed to do this conversation in Bhutan a few years earlier, I was worried. I was worried because I thought the city Mala would talk about, and the city I speak about, which is about policemen, criminals, and journalists, all in the same category. Uh, I thought not far it, from mine. Not far from yours at all, actually. <laughs> and that's the truth. The, I found amazing likeness to what Mala sees in the city, and me, the perpetual outsider, sees to the city. And so our conversation worked. Uh, but being the outsider, I'll ask the insider, Mala, to kind of give us a quick history of the last days of the Mughal Empire to the 1950s, which you talk about? Well, I'll start by saying that um, I'm not going to give you a history, but how the new city came up on the edge of the old, the last city, which was Shah Jahanabad, which was really the first capital of Delhi. They say there are lots of capitals, but they were not strong capitals like Shah Jahanabad was. And when Latians was commissioned to build the imperial capital of the jewel in the crown, he tried actually to face that new city looking at Shah Jahanabad. But unfortunately, along that route, there was a lot of habit, I mean, it was a very um, densely habited area, inhabited area, and they couldn't pay off everybody and compensate them. So in many ways, there was no link to the last city and the imperial capital. And he turned the capital to face Indraprastha. So it stood alone, isolated. So in many ways, it became a sterile city that, was, that took over a piece of land and just mushroomed. It came up much like Chandigarh. So it didn't really connect with the city that had now given up its power center. And um, from New Delhi, they built 
the boulevard, they put in their victory uh, gate, they had uh, the, pres the Viceroy's house, which is now the presidential palace. And then we became independent, Mountbatten walked down, Raja Gopalachari, the first governor general of uh, India, inhabited the house, and the rest is history. In the 50s, a new Delhi began to grow. And it mushroomed in a very haphazard, chaotic manner with no planning, no real planning. So you had, in my definition, little ghettos that came up on the periphery of what was conceived as an imperial capital. So you had a lawyer's colony, Neeti Bagh. You had um, the East Pakistan di Displaced Persons Colony. It was called EPDP Colony, which is now called Ch Chitaranjan Park. So the Bengali citizenry of the city lived there. And then you had Vasant Vihar, where the bureaucrats were given, given land at concessional rates. Again, I think that's very important now, looking in hindsight, that the government gave its own support system rebated land, obviously knowing that that was the way they were going to compensate the bureaucrats who then sell their land and become crorepatis, you know? <laughs> there was a whole cycle, I think, to this whole thing. And, and you had this rather strange city grow. Uh, Jorbag, for instance, and it was actually Chorbag, where all the <laughs> thieves who were operating, picking bricks and mortar and pipes and wires while the imperial city was growing, actually took all the, all the stuff that they had stolen and kept it in this area. And it was called Chor, uh, Chorbag. And uh, when it became a residential upmarket property, uh, it changed its name to Jorbag. Conveniently. <laughs> Very conveniently. So you had all this uh, coming up and then you suddenly saw the influence of Corbusier entering this new Delhi. He was given a piece of land, but just shut me up when I'm <laughs> talking. <laughs> Who uh, he was given a piece of land um, uh, in the Punjab, and you know, after partition, I think there was so much trauma at the border and in the Punjab that this was one way to celebrate a freedom from all that. And this new city came up, but it came up in concrete. And it was just impossible because concrete doesn't breathe. And we brought in a new genre of building uh, that lives with us even today, which is really quite, quite unlivable. Um, it was a great monument. We need to preserve it. It was called Bouzier in the East. So I'm not suggesting it be demolished. It should be, become a landmark. But we got terrible influences that came from that. We gave up our own ways of building, uh, our own uh, ideas on how to ventilate a living space, and a lot of things. I won't get into all that. So you had this rather strange city, and then you had, I think 15 years ago, the beginnings of the metro. And that made it a metropolitan city. So you had these huge flyovers that linked all these uh, areas around the core of what was the imperial capital, conceived as the imperial capital, now called Latians Delhi for a lack of any other words. And that became the power center. So what the British were doing to us, forgive me, now our own governments are doing to us from that seat of power. So it, it smells of power. But, yeah, can I come back to this point which you were mentioning that um, it was not an organic growth. It came in suddenly, it couldn't connect the cities, the Latians Delhi, which we're talking about. So was it in the making of the city that the disenfranchisement with the citizens started? Or is it in how we have been governed since? I think it's a, it's a bit of both because the imperial capital, they, were, they weren't intending to retreat. Hmm. When they were, when they laid the foundations and had started building it, and you had the Simon Commission and all of that, and you realized that the Brits were going to retreat, but they continued with building the capital. And it, during the transfer of power, they transferred a sterile space as the capital, the citadel of power, looking down, metaphorically, on everyone else. And I think we carried that tradition, even though we became a democracy and a secular democracy, we did not say, all right, that's there, but the rest of Delhi that we plan around it will take on a completely different ethos. 
we carried on that same ethos of you guys live there, you guys live there, you guys live there, till 15 years ago, when I think the metro actually became a great leveler. It connected all these disparate groups. And now Delhi is becoming a city, as opposed to being <clears throat> a capital with little islands and pockets of people living around there who come to work in that capital center. Totally disconnected from the old city of Delhi, which is Shah Jahanabad. Because the culture of Shah Jahanabad is completely different. It's like me going from New Delhi, I go pretty much like a tourist to Old Delhi. And I say, let's make a plan, let's go there, let's go eat at, uh, at Karim's, we'll go to Kinari Bazaar, we'll buy some soap at you know, a shop there, some atar, uh, go and look at some antiques and come back. Hmm. It's not integral to my living in New Delhi. You know, um, this, is, this subject, Ma Mala picks this up in the very first page of her book, how citizens engage with their city. And if a citizen is not engaged, if we do not feel that we are part of the city, how cities get neglected. And I'll read from that. As a result of decades of neglect and mismanagement of unthinking land use, and most tragically, the toxic transformation of the holy river Jamuna, on whose banks it sprawls to a polluted stream, the Delhi of our children's children is likely to be an unholy, abysmal mess. Pause for a moment and imagine with me if you can. And just pause and imagine this city she is trying to tell us about. A city with the clear and languid waters of the Jamuna meandering through her center, much like the Danube or the Thames through their cities. Imagine how such a tangible reality could have restored the dill of the city, the heart. Make her heart come alive. Yet, that was not to be. Do you want to go for a second? And I'm trying to imagine the demolishing of a far lesser city, a, a slum colony which was once Asia's largest. Yeah. In 1982, when Delhi was preparing to host the Asian Games, workers from across the country and beyond its borders had swarmed to the city to meet the construction demands. After a week or two of national euphoria and pride, the athletes left. The event was declared a success by the state, the officials packed their bags, the guests and spectators returned home, and the everyday business of the city resumed. But there were many who could not go back. The invisible workers stayed on, tackling different hurdles and running other races, building their uncertain lives on the banks of a moribund river not very far from the newspaper offices. Known as Yamuna Pushta, a shanty town grew, housing at its peak over 100,000 people. 30 years later, another sporting event, the Commonwealth Games, displaced them. A six-lane expressway and multi-story buildings now stood like forgotten memorials to the tin and tarpaulin shacks and kacha roads. What took three decades to build vanished in four years of bulldozing, authorized by numerous court orders and choreographed by a powerful state. The evicted residents of the Yamuna Pushta scattered to the city's outskirts. Shorn of a protective community, raucous neighbors, the mindful eyes of uncles and aunts, and robbed of li livelihoods, the poor became poorer, petty thieves became criminals, and criminals aspire to be gangsters. Thanks, Mala. Mala, you know, in, um, in Rana Dasgupta's capital, <clears throat> he mentions this old waterways which would come to the emperor's court in, in the, at Red Fort. And it comes via the city where the people live. And because it's going to the emperor, it's reaching the emperor, it was kept very clean. With the coming of the British government, we started having taps. Rana Sam and, and many other scholars is that we lost the understanding of where water comes from. We forgot its source. It just comes out of a tap and therefore did not bother enough about it until it has reached this Moriban River or a swamp as you call it. Um, so what is this disconnect that 
citizens have, and not only in Delhi, but in many of our Indian cities, from a civic sense? No, I, 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 think, I think I'm going to step back a bit here. I don't think you can blame the citizen. Because you had independence, you had a command economy. You had a state that determined where you looked, what you did, how you ate, what you ate, which shampoo you used. Um, no, you know, they, the British had covered those uh, waterways, protecting themselves from what they thought were breeding spots for mosquitoes. Now, running water does not breed, I mean, mosquitoes don't breed in, uh, breed in yeah. running water, but they close those, so the, and the river, the river till the Mughals were there flowed right to the edge of the wall of the Red Fort. Then building starts, then the land becomes prime. So it's like building on a highway, on the edge of a highway that's prime land, you know, on the main roads and so on. And our planners actually did not look at the organic reality of the city of Delhi, this new Delhi, Latians, in fact, had looked at it very carefully, in my, in my um, belief. I mean, he really studied the city. For instance, I'll give you an example. Roads, forget rivers for, I mean, um, yeah. the canals for a minute. Roads. He built roads where every kilometer you had a rotary. And then the roads took off from that rotary. So I, when I was studying this for my book on the building of New Delhi, the rotary was put in as a, as a comma to those huge those winds, that, the hot winds that swept through Delhi in the old days. You had the loo. They stopped the loo. The loo then turned and went. It didn't sweep through the city. It was blocked. It took different directions. That's why the rotary. He had a certain depth of field for the hedges that were built around the houses so that you buffered the sound of the road and traffic. So there were various things that were done like that. Where the sun fell in the morning, you had shady trees. At sunset, parts of the city, you had bushes and flowering bushes. So it was very carefully planned. New Delhi, post-independence, they had planners who had no understanding of urban planning. So they just built in concrete because that was what Corbusier had put in place. You have these ugly water towers over every Indian city. You can spot a city by saying, oh, the city, the town is quite close because I can see the water tower. It links India, that grim, horrible concrete water tower. But I'm going to come in here, yeah. uh, ask you a question about this. I mean, there are several theories of city building and, you know, uh, and we, I don't, while not going much into the theory, there has been a lot of conversation about imperial cities, Paris, for example, uh, Berlin now, that the earliest towns and the, the old Delhi which we know of small lanes where cars can't drive in, the army can't move in very quickly, the police find it difficult to penetrate, big boulevards, huge footpaths, grand designs were built also as a mechanism of control, the masses, where forces can move in quickly where army comes in quickly, where the police can come in quickly. That is why these new cities were built. Now, the, my question in this regard, and you might dismiss this Moscow idea. Moscow is, the best, is, is the, the best example. Now, Latians Delhi is, there is almost, a, I mean, there's no connect with the Delhi that was and this new imposition which was built. However grand it was, however much it took in the morning sunshine and the afternoon loop. There was no connect, no. Sorry, the morning sunshine and afternoon loo. You guys will mock that okay. because you come from no, no, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> air conditioning. A different view. Um, we don't mock it because we have to live in nine months of heat. No, I don't and come no, from no, here. No, 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 one minute. The old city had narrow lanes. I mean, yeah. because the shadow fell. Mm. You kept the cool. The city kept the cool. Ordinary people lived in cool. We didn't have air conditioning. You had a terkhana where you went underground in the summer to sleep at night because it was cool. Then you have post-independent India urban affairs department that says we ban all basements. Why? Why? You can build a basement, but you can't have a bathroom in the basement. Why? Now, that's our tradition. Build underground. Keep cool there. You would cut down your electricity consumption for air conditioners. I know we have a basement in a home, in my brother's home. He never has to turn on the fan in the middle of summer. So I, I think we gave up a lot of our building traditions that were tried and tested 
worked in a certain climate, worked culturally, and we superimposed an alien concept of a city even after independence. So post-imperial capital Latians, we should have re-looked at the spaces that grew around and not imitated them, cloned them without any thought. That's what created the horror of Delhi and carries on mm. to be a horror for Delhi. So I'll read, again, uh, you've written a lot on these, this matter. Let me read from her book. Very boring to read from my book, but anyway. <laughs> we have decided this beforehand, so we'll carry on, Marla. <laughs> a new builder had read its head, the DDA. Established in 1957, it became obviously active from 1967 onwards. It took about 10 years to get active. The name itself was undemocratic, unfriendly, anti-city, anti-people. It was an authority. And heaven help you if you questioned it. Did you? All the time. <laughs> Heavy-handed, uninitiated in the nuances of architectural styles and the past's delicate aesthetic sensibilities, the men who ruled the roost from then to now have surely and steadily uprooted and destroyed this fine, fragile, and layered ancient city as they race to create the modern middle-class slums that surround us. We'll have a chat on that. These habitats... No, because are, you're misinterpreting. <laughs> I'll come to it. These habitats are alien spaces, disconnected with the ethos and idea of India and Bharat. I'm skipping a bit to Latian's Delhi. Latian's Delhi had been a low-rise area, a garden city, till one day, the Francesca, Francesca? Francesca. Fon Francesca. Francesca. The Francesca Hotel, I can't even pronounce these words. On one, one, on one end of the Mansing Road was sold off with all the old trees, sentinels of past secrets that had once littered its spacious ground to the Taj group of hotels that was desperate for a presence in the capital city. And then it goes on about the looting of... So may Nibeli. I answer that before I get yeah, yeah, connected and then read you? Yes. I haven't asked a question. Uh, no, no, because I know what your question is. Um, <laughs> middle class slum. When I say that, the authority told people, you're going to live in these concrete little flats that look like fake Corbu blocks. Corbusier blocks. They were hot, they were smelly, they were ugly, they retained all the, uh, all the spices from the kitchen, the smell of spices, they were just ghastly. And they did not allow people who actually bought these spaces to participate in the process of how they would like to live. So there was no ownership, in the true sense of the word, of the spaces that you were going to live in. And if you're a modern country that's just become independent after long colonial rule with a heritage that is quite, quite fantastic in terms of urban development and building techniques, surely we should have taken the citizen into debate, discussion, um, connection with what they were going to live in. That was my thing. So they created these things, they put them in because they could bully them into going and living there. There were shortage of spaces to live in this new unfolding city that was the city of opportunity and government jobs. So, you know, I think that we failed in the 50s to give our cities, and it's not just Delhi, that integrity that is required for a classless, happy city where everyone, where, as a leveler, you know, we failed to do that. We created a caste hierarchy. And Corbusier did that. The rich lived closest to the point of work. The poor lived outside at the edge of that new city. They had to cycle to work. The man with the car just had to drive for one minute to get into his office. Completely, and he was that Stalinist. He should, it should have been the other way around. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. And we just took that and we created those hierarchies again. Mm -hmm. And now, I don't think you should break those down. You ha those are your landmarks. That is part of your history. That's the part of the life of a city. But even now we haven't re-looked at the model. You take Mahindradaro, you take Jaipur, both planned cities. 
they were both very organic. If you look at them in comparison to Delhi or Corbusier, even in terms of materials used for building. So now you've got and somebody sitting in the audience or was who was doing working on smart cities. This is a new thing that we've got. India is going to have these smart cities. We're going to be connected with Wi-Fi. We don't have electricity, but we'll have Wi-Fi. Uh, we don't have running water that's portable, but we are smart. So my suggestion in a city like Jaipur was, fine, do all that, put it all in, but can we conserve and develop and support the soul of these old cities by allowing just living legacies to thrive because those legacies live. And if you do that, and if you allow vendors, for instance, which is a very old tradition of ours, where people went from house to house selling wares, they were the eyes and ears of that area where people lived. You didn't need a police force that's standing there with a lati. Everyone knew what was happening. But now they're the first ones picked up in a theft happens. They are picked up immediately. We have not worked a mechanism where you say, here's a badge, you're bona fide. Go through the cell. We have not, we have taken our flower markets and chucked them on the outskirts of the city. For what reason? Every colony, it should be mandatory that every colony sells cut flowers and plants and herbs and masalas in their little local markets. We, instead of encouraging that, we are, I think, cloning a very sterile, and I'm going to use a very uh, loose word, Western model that we don't really identify with. We want to touch and feel. We want to... My grandfather used to cut the... Uh, watermelon, taste it to see if it was sweet before he bought it. And we've lost all that. And cut now to pa France or to uh, England or you go anywhere. The big thing is that local market on Sunday or the flea market. I mean, you're taking all our ideas and we are discarding them. Mm. So my thing is bring the soul back into your city, leave the concrete there and don't build with concrete, concrete in the future. Uh, that's all I'm trying I mean, to say. Let's stop I'm this one. Read no, 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 hang on, hang on. I, I'm I'm gonna, gonna no, 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 one second. I have a quick question before you get no, we, we can't stop this one. Now, uh, I said, answer this as honestly as no, you possibly can. Now it's going to be really difficult. No, no, no. no. Now, uh, there has been a lot of question, Mala, about the injustices of Latians, which you just speak about. Uh, the sprawling bungalows of ministers in South Delhi, uh, New Delhi. Now, one way of saying it is, let the legacy remain for a minister and his family, or her family, or use these spaces. The buildings can, the architecture can, use them more democratically. How would you approach the problem of space in East Delhi, or in West Delhi, and in more My approximate dream. to your... My dream. My dream is to go into the estate of the presidential estate in New Delhi, put in what the British used to call a chummery, and put all the members of parliament there when they're attending parliament, and let them have a little kitchenette and one bedroom, and let them go back to their constituencies and start working on their constituencies for their people for the rest of the year. Right? Mm. Cabinet ministers can have their houses, and they have to exit the next day, and instead of the four acre plots, you put 10 exactly the same design houses there and put them in two spaces. The rest, auction and let people who've got money buy and live. So therefore, and, and, I have a problem. And, no, no, no. Let me and, have to talk a bit more. <laughs> and, 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 where the government of India, under the command economy, in the 50s, took over what were the palaces of Royal India in New Delhi, and made them into filthy um, courts and uh, railway uh, booking offices, uh, such like. They should be returned and they should be made into museums of the warp and weft of India, the crafts of India, close off that area, make people, make it pedestrian, have foods of India sold there, have restaurants, make it, make people of the city take ownership of their capital that represents their country. Let the government get out of all these buildings. That's step one. And that will not happen because the state 
will always dominate till the people take ownership and till you have leadership that says, like in Rajasthan, the chief minister of Rajasthan had one of those buildings, took, she got it back, she restored it, and then she said to a bunch of us, I want to return this to the city of Delhi. I said, what does that mean? She said, do something there, no membership, people can walk in there, create a space. So we created a gen an arts space. In one year, it is the single most buzzing space in Delhi. Now you could do that right around that whole area of Latians, Delhi, the core area. Latians had deemed it as a cultural nexus point. He had the archives there, the National Museum. So you can create spaces that you open to the public. So what was it that uh, Latian's ambition was thwarted. What do you mean? I mean, the idea of... No, no, creating. he put that down as a principle of a city plan. Yeah. No, so how did it not happen? You had... the India became independent. We had a dictatorial regime for all practical purposes in terms of administration. So they said, this is how you'll do it. We're taking over all these places because we are becoming democratic now. We are a secular democratic republic. Who are these Maharajas? Take it, make it a railway, bu a bus stop, a railway booking office, uh, and reduce these beautiful specimens of architecture into bastardized spaces where they put up in the gardens, they put up another block of flats which had no connection to anything. It wasn't even a contrast like in, in, in Paris. It's not a contrast to the Louvre, the, the, the pyramid. It was unthinking. There was this new flush of excitement of independence, and you had some guy who said, just build like this and get on with it. And we destroyed an entire era of architecture and city planning in Delhi. You could have looked at it sensibly. I mean, when people said, make Rashtrapati Bhavan into the, uh, what? Uh, Safsajang Hospital, I mean, I think that's ludicrous. You know, why should you do that? Why are you ashamed of a beautiful building which you could use for the public sensibly? You don't have to make everything into a hospital or a, a law court. You could make it into a museum. You could make it into a public library and open it to the people. And Rashtrapati Bhavan has, in the last three years, been open. People can walk through it. You know, there's shops, there's a cafe. It's beginning to happen. So you need to get politicians to let go and let the citizen begin in a structured manner to take ownership of their spaces. Well, I'm going to ask you one and last... No, no, well, hang on, we'll read it at the end. It's, uh, I'm going to ask you one last question in this session and open it to the public spaces and then, uh, if need be, I'll come back to it. Um, your opinion on... Why are you cross-examining me? I should be cross-examining no, no, no. you. You see, you're in conversation with me. <laughs> so... Uh, a uh, lot of land regulations has been um, eased, shall I say, uh, building regulations. Suddenly you see these uh, old houses in socket in much of the south being torn down and suddenly um, four or five manzil flats being built. Um, the use of resources, uh, groundwater, electricity is huge. Um, your thoughts on this New Delhi, which is being built and being built for the rich, and the yeah for the wealthy, uh, yeah. for people who got money. Yeah. So and the rest, the slums, nobody's caring about. Nobody's caring. So that started really in, in my memory with Sanjay Gandhi giving this Fonseca Hotel, which I write about, uh, out on auction. The Taj took it over. They pulled it down. It was a the zone was a no high rise zone and he was given special permission to go up. And that became a caveat, I mean, that became the precedent for others who could bribe, then the bribery started. Then you bribe someone to put a swimming pool in an area where there is no water and you wait two years and it works and then the inspector comes, every time he comes, you give him a lakh of rupees, he goes away, sends his kid to school in London or wherever, comes back for another <laughs> bit of thing. So it carries on like that. And that cycle hasn't stopped, let me tell you, even today as we speak. Um, so la everything was, you could twist every rule because you could pay off somebody. Now, I can talk endlessly of the whys and I'm not getting into that. You then allowed 
up to 91 feet. Again, I'm sorry to go back no, to no, Latians. No, please do, please do. Latians had put a height of Sujan Singh Park, three floors, 91 feet, for flats. Okay? Uh, everything started going up. That's the first gated colony in, in Delhi. It's not gated. Well, it's, it That's has a rubbish. gate. It's not gated at <laughs> it has all. There are huge high gates. There are no high gates. Oh, it's, or maybe I imagine it because I can never enter without your permission. That's the hotel ambassador, dear. Yeah, that's true. That's no, what we, that's, that, is, that is now this new thing. You have to be protected. The terrorist might come. It's an open space. He could, you know, the hotels have to have guards and, uh, you know, metal detectors and all of that. We never had that when we were growing up. It only came with the hotel. So that's a separate issue. That's, that we can talk about ad nauseum. But I think this business of allowing a one floor or two floor building to go up to four floors is, has absolutely destroyed the water table of Delhi. It has destroyed just everything, the atmosphere. Because one family, you've now got five families eating out of that same resource. That resource is drying up, so tankers are now brought in to fill your overhead tanks with water so that you can pull your flush. It doesn't come through the pipes. You're not allowed groundwater because the table has gone down. So these things come from a lack of, what I said in the beginning, proper urban planning. If you build a house, you must put in X number of trees, you must have so much green space. There are no requirements. Except you cannot have a bathroom in the basement for whatever that, you know, that's where we've gone wrong. Why not basements instead of floors? In a city that is hot for 10, year, uh, 10 months of the year, you should make basements mandatory, frankly. Because your, your electricity consumption will go down because you can sit in the basement. Green areas, every house should have a green, the houses are built virtually on the pavement today to capitalize on every inch that they can get. So there are no norms. Okay. One last question. I keep on saying this one last. But what you have said and what we have spoken about the city is the city for people who, you know, people who identify with the city, people who have grown up in the city, people who feel nostalgic about the city. But Delhi is also a city where people come to, you know, people outside. We come there for work, jobs, studies. How does the city treat them? Now, at the cost of you sort of snapping at me. <laughs> I never snap at you. <laughs> I think we are very welcoming. We are indifferent and welcoming. We are both. All human beings are indifferent and welcoming. Depends on who you want to welcome. I don't think that, and if you're thinking of the killing of the six in Delhi, and if you're thinking of X, Y, Z that happened in Delhi, those were political reasons. Those were not individual personal reasons of rejecting or be being insular. I think a lot of individuals saved each other in those politically volatile times. Um, I think Delhi has seen all kinds of people come and go. And in fact, when the Mughals came, they, um, coming from Agra, they found these hamlets, Nizamuddin being one of them, and they threw a red rope around these hamlets with a decree not to disrupt, disrupt or disturb the local hamlet. It was called Lal Dora. Dora yeah. To this day, Lal Dora areas, which are now part of the core of Delhi, have a separate set of municipal rules. They don't abide by the general municipal rules, which again is a problem because in Lal Dora, you can have the wall of a building here and the second wall can be right here. Huge fire hazard. But nobody can intervene and say, that is incorrect. You cannot build like that. So there are lots of problems and nobody's addressing them. Mm. And they're not ex addressing them in the Lal Dora areas because they're Muslim predominant areas. So administrations have felt that if we do that, a political, there'll be a political reaction. Um, I tried to work in Nizamuddin for intact to uh, reinvent it and make it a much more sort of accessible space. It was very difficult. Today they've managed to do it. The Aga Khan Foundation has worked and done a lot of good work there. So we're slowly 
coming to terms with all these inherited problems. But I think the main point is citizens have to take ownership of their spaces, make demands, protest, walk the talk, and not just accept what is doled out and find the easy option of paying off someone for something that they want to do, but they can't. Okay, I'll... Uh, no, I'm going to read. No, no, we'll do this later. I will just move on. Um, uh, I'll, uh, questions, anyone? And if uh, need be to, uh, later on, I can come back. But uh, um, the floor is open. Don't groan. Indian uh, cities are hear. a complete disaster. Can when you uh, have it closer, yeah? Um, whenever I visit in the, uh, Bombay or Delhi, um, I get very frustrated by the complete lack of urban planning. Um, is there any city, uh, even in a small area, where you see some hope, some examples of very good uh, attempts to create uh, inclusive and uh, livable cities? Yeah, I mean, Udaipur. Udaipur? Um, clean, very clean in fact, uh, railway station, you can eat off the floor, I mean it, I, I, I was really surprised, um, very carefully planned, even in its growth, people have taken pride of their city and I, th I think it's a model, I had suggested it, it be uh, resurrected from being some little tourist space. Uh, and be given an award on how you actually take ownership of your space. The lakes are clean. If something comes up illegally on the lake, there's a huge protest. Government has to retreat. The gentleman in the black waistcoat here. I know, yeah. No, no, no. We don't need to let him ask any question. No. Okay, I, I'm chairing it. Okay, so I'll in here. <laughs> yeah, please go ahead. All right, cool. Thanks. Uh, so I used to live in GK1 in Delhi uh, before AAP came into power. Now, Delhi obviously is the political capital of the country, but it also is a place where there's a lot of political conflict right now between the BJP and the AAP and constant back and forth. Is that hampering the or slowing down the development that possibly a party could be doing? It didn't hamper Sheila Dixit for 15 years. She right. made but Delhi into a great city. Yeah. She connected with roads, she power supply, water supply, she fought the battles. She didn't whine on and say, oh, you know, the governor is not on my side. She fought for it. And I really believe, if the next question is going to be, if I can read your mind, that, you know, AAP is doing great work in the slums. And so if the slums, so good, you should be doing great work in the slums. But then do you want not to work in the other part of the city and make that into a bigger slum? Or are you going to do your work in a, in a sort of cohesive, sensible manner with a plan? Right, we'll have the gentleman in the... I was only seeing uh, uh, similarities between Delhi and Rome. I mean, Rome, for instance, uh, nasty old Mussolini, you know, who everyone you know, says, of course, he has this very dark side, we know. But he planned Rome, a new Rome called Eur, which he was planning to put all the, uh, the, the government uh, outside. outside so they wouldn't start you know, interfering with the cultural center. And it was called... But was, that's because he was Italian, he understood culture. I know, <laughs> but, but, but since then, they've done everything to destroy... You have not, Stefano. What? Rome is a fantastic city where the new and the old... No, you're Italian, so we'll talk about that later. Okay. But I'm just saying that Rome has worked a system where the old, the monument and the metaphor live successfully compared to other cities. Would you say that? Uh, 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 my visits to Rome have been very sporadic, unlike yours. Uh, hands again. <laughs> Sorry, Mala. <laughs> hands again. <laughs> Uh, gentleman in the front in the green sweater, please. Uh, just a comment, really. <clears throat> I'm an Englishman who lived in Chandigarh for um, 18 months. Uh, not That's very long. long ago. Gosh. <laughs> Good gosh. Doing um, what? But, uh, and I have to say, amongst uh, architects I've met, it's, uh, it's always it's an article of faith for them that the place is a masterpiece and they won't uh, brook any criticism. Um, so I'm 
I'm glad to hear someone who, uh, who has your views because I, I, I certainly share them. But I noticed that in Chandigarh there are sectors where the, uh, the wealthy can build their own villas, which are, um, of course, ugly very, to very, boot. Mm. Well, they're not very be beautiful, but they're very comfortable inside. Uh, but they don't have to live in those, uh, in those nasty uh, concrete uh, apartment blocks. But um, I noticed traveling across Punjab, uh, if people in villages have a bit of money, they tend to build themselves really very ugly concrete um, uh, structures, often in the middle of fields or, or, or wherever. But is there a um, domestic uh, style, indigenous, indigenous style, um, is there an indigenous style of domestic architecture which you think would serve as a model for, uh, for India? Well, there are, but there are many. So every area district has its own virtually. And if we were to leave, you see, democracy. You can't tell somebody, you know, now you have to build like this. In Bhutan, they say the facades have to be Bhutanese. In Delhi and in, in, in India, you can't say that. Because each to his own, and I believe in that. However, you could have certain basic norms. You could say water, green, so much, you know, so much percentage of your plot has to have green, so many trees. They do it in other parts of the world. We need to do that. But there's some charming things about the villages of Punjab. Their water tanks are not these ghastly um, water tanks awesome. created by, what's his name, Corbusier. There's a football, and then one is an aeroplane, and one is a temple. And, you know, they're like installations on top of the houses. They're really quite wonderful. But Mala, I mean, if democracy is, uh, you know, if you can build any way you want, do you think generally, and I speak this hugely, that Indians have bad taste and do bad buildings? Not at all. You know, I'm just asking. As I said, I'm, don't all. fly at me, I'm asking. Is this bad taste? But she cho you chose it, right? You chose no, it. this yeah. was made by somebody in some village yeah, yeah, yeah. where they did this, and I just happened to buy it. This was not made by me. No, no, I didn't I say that. So this is from rural India. See how they she snaps at me. <laughs> OK, we're deviating. Um, you never um, ask any of the women. There are two women. Good Lord, yeah, OK, right, right there. What kind of right. man are you? Right. No, you take the questions now. Uh, lady in the third row. And then there. Yeah, the, yeah, third row. I'm not moderating. He's moderating. <laughs> you are. I just wanted to say that, first a comment, that for Delhi, my wish list would be to have a botanical garden, perhaps an indoors covered market, and as you say, a museum of textiles, because they are some of India's most beautiful riches to the world. But there are so many unsung heroes, and we don't realize, for instance, that Delhi, after Nairobi, is a second richest capital in the world when it comes to wildlife birds yes so incredible bird life and then but Geetika, one second you know why because latians delhi you cannot interfere and pull down the trees and do that you have to keep the green lung it is great he who did that yeah, so no, that's that's a part and the ridge mm -hmm, absolutely and then there are the aravali biodiversity parks yes that are just quietly there and just unsung heroes are just protecting them and planting endemic species. Those are really great stories. But the comment that I want to make, and I have to ask you, Mala, what you think of this idea. I was recently in the Faroe Islands, just north of here, and absolutely nowhere in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, a lot of the Nordic countries are starting a scheme called Haima Blidni, which is home hospitality. And I think Delhi is just the sort of place where visitors could come home for a meal. It started. Uh, in fact, I have uh, somebody sitting here in the audience who does it all the time, cooks very first-rate gourmet meals, and all kinds of strange people come to her house, and she befriends them all. Seriously. I'll introduce you to her. Yes. Over there at the corner, oh. next to the red show. Yes, you're the one getting it. Natalie. To come back to your comment about planning without consulting the people, when we lived in Cairo, the best neighborhood of Cairo even now is the city of Heliopolis, which was built completely from scratch a little before Latin's Delhi mm. by Baron Alpin, who, who took a great care of consulting local people to know exactly where the kitchen could be located compared to, to, to take into consideration the, the local usages. And he also, was very careful about 
creating a mix of wealthy homes and, and more simple homes in the same neighborhood. And a hundred years later, it's still a variable, very, it's the only yeah, actually organic. livable part of Cairo. Hmm. But my, my question, because that was a hundred years ago, uh, would be how would you uh, Do apply it the same principle to a, 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 an exploding population? Can you avoid building vertically with materials like concrete um, if, if you have so many people to accommodate? Yes, I think you could because we have a lot of indigenous um, materials with which we can build. Concrete is quite expensive. You can still build with brick and mud. And those have survived. No, but you don't have to go up. My point is you go up somewhat. I live in a building that is four stories high and there's no concrete in it. So Jansing Park was built by Latin, sorry. No, no. I mean, <laughs> uh, it has a brick roof. I mean, the ceiling is brick with just some steel rods and satna, which is a mixture of, of sand and whatever. And it's put in a little bit of cement, very little, just to hold it. It's all brick and deep walls. And you can still build in that. We make a lot of brick. And there are solutions. What I'm saying is I'm not a, a planner or an architect. I'm just saying... What we're doing is wrong. And we really need to rope in people and think of new ideas, particularly this new generation. Why should they live like we had to live? I mean, not me, but most people. <laughs> Before, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm nice. good. Let her, let her. Uh, One sec. Uh, <laughs> we'll well, I mean, I grew up in next. Delhi uh, for 35 odd years. I lived there. Um, it is a city which seems to always want to promote people who want to go get ahead, which basically means now increasingly cars and scooters, the, the whole idea of the way city has grown without a room for a pedestrian, effectively. It's a notion of what is the sign of growth, whether it's Chitranjan Park we're looking at or Saket, which when I moved there was I, from my house, I could look two kilometers out of the house. Now, you know, you can't without stepping into something. But that's what, that's what I've said. I've said we, they didn't plan. At least Latians, Delhi, still has footpaths. That the whole because thing he is, planned it like that. It's got nothing to do with power. This is the second do question, with... which is as a city, as like when, even when they win the Formula One track, somewhere, Gurgama or whatever, architecturally, all over the world, the, any new tracks have a fantastic sense of architecture. We somehow don't have that. It seems like architecture is a second-rate idea. It is. Or a planning is a second-rate idea. And internally, there is very little promotion of that. Architecture, if you ask me, we don't have any... Well, I'm not going to get into that. And I, did um, I think our planning has been so faulty that you, we have not encouraged, therefore, really interesting architecture. Nobody wants to go and work with 18 different departments of government have to bribe their way through to build a building that has a glass ceiling like this. I mean, you, for that, you'd have to atrium. You'd have to go through... I mean, you'd be dead before you got your permissions. So you have to restructure the mechanisms for urban planning and growth, into which fits the aesthetics, the architecture, uh, the requirements, the, the, uh, the do's and don'ts of urban planning. Question. Hello. Is it on? Can you hear? On? Can yeah, you it hear? Is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so you, at, at one point you said that the citizens need to take ownership for the city. Yeah? Uh, this is a comment as well as a question to you. Uh, I feel that in the entire country, if the common man is not given his basics, which is roti, kapra, and makan, I don't think there is any space in their mind, their mind space to think of all the rest. So I think it is the responsibility of the government first I agree. to give roti, kapra, and makan. makan for the people who don't understand those three words. It means your food, your shelter, and your clothes. clothes. Yeah, till that is not taken care of, where is the space? I'll tell you, I, I, all this beautiful architecture, which is no, no, amazing. no, no. I, I, I think there'll always be these disparities. We have gone a long way in 70 years, and I think that that's what I mean by planning. You have to take in a city. Let's just take one city. You have to take care of that, 
simultaneously with the other. You, so for that, you have to rewrite the rule book. We have inherited a rule book from the retreating colonial power that fitted a time and an ethos. They were ruling us. Our planners think that they are ruling us. They're the brown sahabs. Till, and it's not just a mentality, it's the rule book they abide by. That has to be scrapped and rewritten. The moment you scrap that and rewrite it, then the likes of all of us will participate in trying to understand what we can do for the city, the young, the old, the infirm, the very wealthy, the very poor, and you could have a very interesting organic space. That's all I'm saying. Malaka, uh, just before the next question, can I ask a slightly more provocative question? Uh, he's dying Wait, oh, no, 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 to provoke. No, 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 no. Uh, da, see, there has been a huge change in the political regimes in recent times. So, does this mean that the direction that India is going will change? Do you feel more hopeful? Uh, you ask me a political question? No, no, no. Will you, or a uh, city question? City question. In the sense that when uh, a completely... Uh, a, uh, I'm going to answer it. A power structure which is completely different in I'm ideology. Gonna, I'm going to answer You should it. be hopeful. I'm not looking at ideology as far as the city is concerned. Because ideologies come and go. Leaders are itinerant. We are perennial. I'm just not going to get into that. I am going to say, however, that when you have a new regime, you try yet again to get them to rewrite the rule book for urban planning. You don't say, I will not engage with the state because I don't politically have the same political inclination. In that context, take Rajasthan. I was asked to engage with the state to create public space, um, art, art in the public space, whatever that's meant to mean. And we are doing it. And we are doing it successfully. And there's no political interference in what we are doing. So as long as... You are true to yourself, you have to engage with the state. And with every new leadership, you have to go back to them and say, will you look at rewriting this? This needs to be done. And now I'm too old, I'm 68. We now need 35-year-olds to go out there and fight for what is their future. And, you know, we are redundant. So one last question, Lady at the front. Um, I would love your opinion on... Sorry, uh, just to hold it closer, please. I would love your opinion on the future of the city. I mean, Delhi, but also cities all over the world. Because the way that they're expanding in terms of landmass at the moment, I worry that in 30, 50 years... I mean, what is the city going to look like, in your opinion? And how will it function if it continues to expand in the way that they are? Well, I mean, I really, uh, that's a scary question because, and I, I'm not even, I don't even want to go, I don't want my imagination to go that far. Uh, because as I say, I'm in the departure lounge and I've seen the good end of it. So, however, if you're talking about Delhi, Delhi fortunately has space to expand laterally into. So we're not, we could extend towards Rajasthan and you'd then have a mass are going all the way through Rajasthan, Haryana, Punjab, and it'll all become urban, God forbid. But therefore, in those urban spaces, you need your green lungs. So those have to become mandatory. Again, I come back to planning. Of course, we are going to grow and we have to plan. And you cannot plan with 68-year-olds. You have to start planning with 35-year-olds whose future is at stake. And they must make those commitments. And that's the ownership I'm talking about. Sorry. Thank you, Mala. No, no. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving her a big hand. Thank you, Mala. You don't want me to no, read your no, last No, it's battle. done, it's done, it's done. Put it down. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, we'd like to <coughs> thank both Mala and Somnath, and we'd also like to thank our sponsors, Z Entertainment, Rajasthan Tourism, Taj Residences London, BBC History Magazine, and the Aga Khan Foundation.